battlefield. This battle was the turning point in the British Southern Campaign and would ultimately lead to the British surrender at the Battle of Yorktown a few months later in 1781. So about 200 yards down this road, which is the old Salisbury Road, is where the American first line was. And the British used the old Salisbury Road to form their battle lines and march against the Americans. Now, all three American lines were situated either next to the road or on the road, and they would actually use this road for their surrender route. So we're about to head to where the American first line was, which is where the battle truly began. So where I'm crouched down right now is roughly where the American first line would have been. Actually, more accurately, they would have been a little bit behind me and they would have stretched way up that way and way down this way. Now, during the battle, this would have been farmlands. The Hoskins farm was a little bit this way and the Hoskins family had actually moved here from Pennsylvania because when the Revolutionary War broke out in 1776, they wanted to get away from all the action, which ultimately their front yard would have become the largest battlefield of the American Southern Campaign. Now, a few months earlier, back in January, General Daniel Morgan defeated Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton at the Battle of Cowpens. And Morgan was one of the first people to figure out how to use American militia effectively. And what he did was he had the militia fire one to two volleys and then fake a retreat. And this would have caused the British to charge after them, thinking they would have won a great victory and they wanted to claim the field. So what Morgan did at Cowpens was as soon as the militia ran, he set his Virginia sharpshooters at a second line to gun down the British officers, which would have caused chaos in the ranks. And then they would have fallen back. And as the British kept charging, they would have run into the Continental regulars, the best the Americans had to offer. Now, Daniel Morgan was not here at Guilford Courthouse, but the strategy that he used at Cowpens was essentially used by Green here at Guilford Courthouse. Now, the Americans wanted to get off one to two volleys, ideally two, to inflict as many casualties as possible, but according to eyewitness accounts and then reports by Cornwallis, General Leslie of the British, and by Green and many other commanders that were there, most of the militia only got off one volley before they ran. Now, what's also really cool, one of the reasons I picked this spot to sit here, other than the fact it's comfortable, is I had a few ancestors who fought here at Guilford Courthouse, and this is roughly the spot that they would have had their guns positioned along the rail fence. And it is really cool, almost 250 years later, to be exactly where they stood. So right now where I'm standing is roughly where the American second line would have been stationed. Now, the original plan was for the second line to be reinforced by remnants of the Virginia and North Carolina militia from the first line. However, this didn't end up happening, and the second line, mainly made up of Virginia militia, had to actually open up their ranks to let the North Carolinians that were fleeing back to the third line through, causing a big gap in the hull. So the Americans reformed their lines and they were waiting for the entire British army to meet them head on, but they never did. In the first line, what ended up happening was a series of fragmented attacks. And this caused the British to meet the Americans at various points in time during the battle. So by the time the fighting was done on the American first line and the British started making their way to the second line, they actually did not reform their lines. Now, this was very strange because typically, the British would. It was, you know, Charles Cornwallis, who was the commander of British forces, was one of the most brilliant tacticians the British had in their entire army. So why he didn't redress his ranks and continue the attack in order, we may never know. But ultimately what ended up happening is you would have one or two British regiments that would meet the American second line one or two at a time. Now, this seems good on paper, but what you would have happen is you would have a British regiment would meet the middle of the Virginia militia and the regiments on the flanks would wheel around to outflank the British regiments and pour fire on them from various angles. 
This is good because it does inflict severe casualties. However, when the British would bring reinforcements or the rest of the British Army would meet the second line, the Americans would be outflanked. Now, combine this with a series of confusing orders, and this caused the American second line to crumble without doing as much damage as Green had hoped. Now, where I'm standing now is roughly where the separate action took place, but it is key to note that the separate action was more of a running fight that took place up to about five miles that way. After the American first line broke, it was basically cut utter chaos. General Lighthorse Harry, actually Lieutenant Colonel Lighthorse Harry Lee, took William Campbell and some of the Virginia militia and actually pulled them back here to the left about half a mile from the American second line. Now why he did this, he wanted to form his own defensive position and some people think that he didn't trust the battle plan of the American second line and he didn't want to risk his precious, precious legion being destroyed. So he took William Campbell and his Virginia Militia and his Lee's Legion Infantry and Dragoons, which is Mountain Infantry or Cavalry, and they formed a defensive perimeter somewhere through this area. Now, they were followed by the Brigade of Guards, the Brigade of Guards Light Infantry, Hessians, and then eventually Tarleton's British Legion. And there was very, very fierce combat that took place through here. The Brigade of Guards started the attack by themselves and they were quickly isolated and the Virginians were able to rout them pretty quickly and it was one of the few times during the war that the Brigade of Guards were routed. Now they were reinforced by the Hessians who were able to push back the Virginians and the fighting quickly turned into a back and forth action. The British would push the Americans back with bayonet charges and then the Americans would push the British back. So while you had Green and his men retreating out the retreat road by the courthouse, you still had intense fighting going on. Now, once the British had control of Guilford Courthouse, just up the road here, Cornwallis was confused as to why there was heavy gunfire coming from this part of the battlefield, so he sent Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton with the British Legion Cavalry dressed in their green camouflage jackets around this road here to see what was going on. And what he found when he got here was that the British soldiers had suffered heavy casualties and that they were pinned down by a rifle fire on all sides. So we have here, it's kind of tough to pan around to, is the Joseph Winston Monument. And Joseph Winston was one of the American commanders that led some brave defenses and attacks of the British position here. And he ended up dying years later. Now when Tarleton reached this position, he quickly flanked the American lines and was able to sweep them up pretty quickly due to the fact that he was on horseback with about 200 legionnaires going up against only a few hundred American riflemen who did not have the ability to fight hand to hand because they lacked bayonets on the end of their rifles. So close to where I'm standing right now is where the American third line would have been positioned. The American third line was made up of the best continental soldiers, mainly the Maryland Regiment and the Delaware Regiment, as well as a few Virginia regiments. Now, these cannons right here are meant to represent the American artillery battery that was positioned in the middle of the third line. These artillery pieces would have been very vital to the American cause, and during the battle, they would actually change hands about four or five times until they were eventually taken by Tarleton's Dragoons at the end of the battle. Now, if you were here on March 15th of 1781, what you would have seen is a line of Americans stretching all the way through here. And you see the British would have had to cross a little valley through a creek, a very treacherous creek, up a ridge in order to meet the Americans. And Green was hoping that he could exhaust the British units so that by the time they made it to the American lines and actually engaged them, they would have lost their will to fight. Now, unfortunately, this isn't what happened, and this is where the most intense fighting at the Battle of Gifford Courthouse would occur. Now, it's also in this area 
where some people say the courthouse exists. According to records, the Guilford Courthouse was a little bit behind the American lines and it was a little bit behind where the retreat road was. So in order to find where Guilford Courthouse stood, we first need to know exactly where the Americans were, which we somewhat know they would have been in this area here. So we need to find where the main road connects with the retreat road. My guess is the courthouse would have been somewhere in this direction. And that's what we're gonna go look for now. Now, unfortunately, we do not know exactly where the courthouse stood here at Guilford Courthouse, where the battle gets its name from. But here in this area, aside from the courthouse, there would have been a total of about five or six buildings. There would have been the courthouse itself, which was a small one-room cabin. There was a little tavern nearby. There was a jail and then other miscellaneous buildings because this was also farmland. Now, something interesting historically is where the American Third Line, there was a slight rise. So you can see a slight rise down there and a slight rise here. The Guilford Courthouse would have been a little bit behind, maybe about 30, 40 yards behind the retreat road, which is believed that the retreat road was maybe 20 or 30 yards up in this direction and it actually extends way out that way. So in theory, the Guilford Courthouse spot would have to be somewhere in this area. My prediction, actually, I would believe it would be somewhere here in the woods. Now, unfortunately, it's a little too populated of an area to do a spirit box session here. But if you look closely, you can see some irregularities in the terrain. As you can see, there is a slight slope up that goes here. And it does almost look like this would have been the spot where a building could have been. But you can also say the same for little areas such as this, especially since they have it cleared out. And unfortunately, we do not have an exact terrain map as to how it would have looked at the day of the battle, aside from a British engineer's map. So it is one of those historical mysteries that may go unsolved. It's still great coming down here for three great days of filming at my favorite battlefield and hopefully I'll have an excuse to come back here again. But I hope you all have enjoyed this documentary as much as I did making it. Hopefully you learned something. And the Battle of Gifford Courthouse is very underrated in terms of its historical importance, especially in American history. A lot of very important things happen on this patch of ground that it just looks like any normal wooded area, but so many brave men lost their lives fighting for a cause they believed in. And that is worth making this documentary film.